This is called this gospel. Proverbs 22, 15. <laughs> Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You know what's weird is I had this sermon, this part of it, written last Sunday morning. Uh, I missed this verse in case you wanted. <laughs> the literal translation of this verse in the Hebrew says, in the place where wisdom and understanding are meant to inhabit, there is foolishness. <clears throat> this verse actually isn't a green light to abuse children. It, but rather it's a prophetic verse concerning the church. In the childish church, there's no wisdom and there's no understanding. There's only foolishness, and Solomon said it's bound there. The word bound, when he used it, means they're in love with it. They're joined together, literally made one with their beliefs. How many know that we're made one with our beliefs, and that's why we defend them so much? Foolishness isn't just a thought or belief, but it actually becomes their identity. How many ever look at the liberals and say, wow, they're blind and deceived? How could anyone, have you ever looked at the liberal media and the people, the, the, the Democrats, and you think, how could anyone actually believe this? How many have ever thought that? How could anyone believe this way? You know why they do? It's their identity. It's become part of their identity. Let me ask you this question. What if the liberal mentality of the natural realm is actually prophetic of the way God views the church? How many understand that you can't change a liberal mindset by argument? How many have ever tried to argue till somebody changed their mind? How many know it doesn't work? How many know you can't change somebody's beliefs with arguments? Whether it's political beliefs or religious beliefs, you can't change beliefs with arguments. What, what did the Doobie Brothers say? What a fool believes the wise man has no power to change with, with logic. And I think that's true. I think it's always just been that. You can't change a fool's thoughts with the logic. Liberals and Christians would both rather die than change. They're like Terryton smokers. How many remember the Terryton cigarette commercials in the 60s? They'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> remember with the black eye? Terryton smokers. We'd rather fight than switch. Solomon said that foolishness becomes the child's identity. How many know it's okay when a child acts foolish. How many know you can't shame a child into not acting foolish? I say to Journey, everybody's smoking. <laughs> Let them. <laughs> Foolishness becomes the child's identity and literally it becomes woven into the fabric of their psyche. The psyche is the soul, the self, the ego, or the mind. Your soul, which is your ego, gives you your personal identity. It makes you who you are, who people know you as. Whether you're reclusive or outgoing, or whether you're sweet or salty. <laughs> so how do you change the way of a mind? Matthew 19. Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily, I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. And they said, Well, then who can be saved? But Jesus beheld them, and he said unto them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So here Jesus makes a prophetic illustration. How many know when Jesus talked, it was always deeper than what you see? 
Jesus' <coughs> thought process goes well beyond anything that we can imagine. So Jesus makes a prophetic illustration, and literally no one gets it. He wasn't saying that rich people almost never become Christians. How many know you're richer than almost everyone that ever lived in past history? So it can't be that, right? We know that it can't be that. It has nothing to do with money. Jesus wasn't saying rich people almost never become Christians. So what was he saying? Well, first let me ask you this. How many were instructed to believe that the only way that you could ever get to heaven was to become a Christian? How many were instructed that? All of us. Everybody. So where exactly did Jesus say that in Scripture? We know that he never said it. Jesus did. He said, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Didn't he? But he said nothing about Christianity. Didn't Jesus say, I am the way? How many know that Jesus said that? So when did Jesus become synonymous with Christianity? When did we say, Jesus is Christian and Christian is Jesus? And when we worship Jesus, we're worshiping Christianity. He never made it synonymous, did he? Somebody did. In all that, Jesus didn't say that he was the way to heaven. Who did he say he was the way to? The Father. Jesus said, I'm the way to the Father. Didn't he say that? Yes. Stay with me. I, I need to so that you look. If you don't look at something from a different angle, you can never see differently. <clears throat> How many have ever experienced a change of heart? How many have ever changed your mind? How many women do we have? <laughs> How many have ever changed your mind? I don't mean about going to Walmart. I was going to go to Walmart, but then I changed my mind. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean a change, a literal change, where you absolutely believed one way, and then all of a sudden you believed another way. It was like the light came on. How many have ever had that happen? How many have ever had an epiphany? And you went, wow, I didn't see that. So you just are going one direction, and then it's like all of a sudden you can see, like you were blind. Like when I was young, I drove Fords. Now I drive Chevys. Once I was blind, but now I can see. I used to put that in for my dad. <clears throat> How many know that in order to change the way you believe, you've got to get this. This is so good. In order to change the way you believe, you must receive understanding of a higher way. This is good. Wow, that gives me goose. That is good. You must see something greater than what you currently believe. The only way you can change is when all of a sudden you see a higher way. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me. And now, save the mind. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give. Ever to him I'll claim. In his blessed presence live. Ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true. Merits my soul's best songs. Faithful loving service to, to him belong. So when you sang this, to whom were you pledging allegiance? I don't want you to just say it off the top of your head because you think it. I want you to say what you really believe. Well, who were you pledging allegiance to? Jesus or Christianity? The teachings of Christ, following Christ, seeking Christ, finding what he's saying, or was it? I learned as much about Christianity as I can. And I'm not trying to be negative. And I want to show you something today that God showed me. And I, I'm just... I'm thankful for this. You know, we all like to believe it's Jesus. Because when you became a Christian, you had a change of heart. How many are thankful for that? I remember the day, and I am thankful for that. I literally, is just, I bless the Lord for that day. You were offered a higher way than what you saw previously, weren't you? 
Since that day, you've, made, you've remained a Christian. Why? Because you don't believe that there exists a higher way. Isn't that true? You become a Christian and you remain a Christian because you do not believe that there exists an, a higher way. In your heart, woven inseparably into the fabric, you've been convinced that Christianity is the highest way. How many would say that it's impossible to convince a Christian that there's even a higher way than what they serve now? I'd say it's impossible. And Jesus also said it's impossible for rich men to go through the eye of a needle, or for camels to go through the eyes of needles. It's impossible to change a Christian's mindset. It's impossible. Why? Because like the rich man's wealth, Christianity is security and confidence. It gives me security. It gives me confidence of heaven and in eternity. What's one of the most shocking revelations of the liberals? When I look at liberals and I see them on the news and this Antifa and all the people that the people that follow the, when they had the Black Lives Matter rallies and, and now the, the March for Women's Rights, which I, I don't understand because they probably have more rights than I do. <coughs> right? I've always heard, it's a lady's night. I've never heard, it's a man's night. <laughs> the, one of the shocking revelations of the liberals to me is that they act and respond to almost everything logical with mind-blowing immaturity, verging on insanity. How many have ever noticed that? It doesn't make any sense. It's literally mind-blowing. <clears throat> Let me ask you, do you think that they see themselves that way? Not at all. Why? Because they're blind to their foolishness, aren't they? A fool is blind to his foolishness. It's, it's his way. The way of the foolish. What if we are blind to the way God sees us? What if the church is blind to the way God sees us? Journey's blind to the fact that I see her as an immature baby. She's blind to that. She doesn't know. It doesn't change. I can tell her all day long, you're acting like a two-year-old. <laughs> she wouldn't change. What if our way appears just as foolish and immature to the spirit realm? What if the spirit realm's watching going, I can't believe they act like that. I can't believe the way they look. They live like that. I can't believe that they believe like that. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's a point to all this. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Strong delusion is a Greek word that means totally effective seducing deception. A totally effective. It means it is absolutely 100% effective seducing deception. It draws them in and deceives them. How many believe that this is on the earth right now? Is that true? This, isn't this happening right now? Isn't it cool to be able to look at Scripture and go, hey, we're right there. The strong delusion is globally covering the natural realm in order to bring the church into a higher way of seeing. If I don't have an example, what do I have to go by? So God uses the natural realm. The word delusion in Webster is fixed beliefs that do not change even when a person is presented with conflicting evidence. That's delusion. I can show you absolute evidence, yet you go, I'm not changing. It's delusion. All delusions are, are linked to wrong belief, which comes through mis in, misinterpretation and a lack of understanding. Always. 
Strong delusion comes through misinterpretation and a lack of understanding. Why are my people destroyed? A lack of understanding. Look at verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Unrighteousness. How many know that in the church, what you see in the church and what you see in the world might have the same word, but it's two different things. Unrighteousness in the church is not, he's not talking about moral badness. He's not talking about immorality in the church. In the world, when you have unrighteousness, you have evil. In the church, when you have unrighteousness, the word literally is wrong. How many have ever been wrong? He says, and with all deceivableness of the, the wrong, wrong doctrine, wrong interpretation. The church is deceived into wrong understanding because the church has never received the love of the truth. They love what's true, but loving what's true is different than loving what's true. That they might be saved. Why? Because truth progresses with the seasons. <clears throat> Being saved is not an event in the life of a believer. It's not something that one day you say, and I got saved and I'm saved. Being saved is always a process. It's a series of actions or steps that progress through truth revealed. How many know Jesus said, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to tell you, but you're just not big enough to handle. We used to sing a song, He Set Me Free. Once like a bird in prison I dwelled freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came, listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. He set me free. Yes, he set me free. How many understand that we sing that and it sounds like something that happened, but freedom is always progressive. Freedom is never a one-time thing. It's always a progression throughout the life of the believer. It has to be a progression. If you believe that you've already been set free, you will never fight for a new level of freedom. The next level of freedom is the next level of holiness. Being separated unto God. Being more separated unto God. Being more separated unto God. Look at Matthew 19 again. And Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say to you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. And they said, who can be saved then? Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men it's impossible. With men it's impossible. With God all things are possible. When Jesus uses the illustration of a camel and the eye of a needle, he's not just exaggerating for effect. He's not like evangelistically speaking. He's not stretching the truth. He was saying that it is as utterly impossible as it would be for a literal camel to go through the eye of a literal needle. There is even less chance of a rich man entering, not heaven, the kingdom. Many believe Solomon when he wrote in Ecclesiastes 3 that there's a season for everything. In chapter 3 of verse 3 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote, There's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. How many believe that? I've been a carpenter for oh, well over 30 years. I've been involved in more remodels than I could ever tell you about. Molitudes. People will call and they'll say, we'd like to have a new kitchen, or a new bathroom, or basement, or attic, or whatever. And so we go in and we remodel. 
How many understand that the tools needed for the beginning of the job are nothing like the tools needed for the end of the job? In the season of breakdown, remember Solomon said there's a time of breaking down and a time of building up. In the season of breaking down, there's drop cloths and plastic and shop backs and hammers and bigger hammers and pry bars and dumpsters. And in this season of breaking down, it's loud, it's dirty, and it's offensive. How many have ever lived in a home where somebody was remodeling? Isn't it loud? Isn't it dirty? Isn't it offensive? It's offensive. It's offensive. I've had lots of people angry during the season of breaking down. The cabinets that you've been familiar with are violently torn down and discarded by carpenters who have no sentimental attachment whatsoever to your stuff. The countertops where you prepare hundreds, maybe thousands of meals where your small children first learn to climb are aggressively, almost savagely, torn from familiar positions and thrown into a dumpster. Many times cut in half with a sawzall. All the memories held by these long-time familiar fixtures are tossed on a trash heap as something no longer useful or desirable. The season of breakdown seems insulting, disrespectful, almost wounding, abusive. At the end of the day, it all appears empty, <clears throat> broken, and almost unfixable. People feel a sense almost of hopelessness when they look and the place where they loved for all those holidays. They remember every part of it and it's gone. But then comes the time of building. Different tools, different skills. Breakdown always seems negative. See, this is what you've got to see. When I stand up here and I tell you things and you think, boy, Dan, you're awful negative. Breakdown season is always feels like it's negative. Always. Why do we have to do that? How many have ever tried to hang cabinets where there's already cabinets? Breakdown seems negative, but it's a vital part of the restoration process. It has to happen. How many realize that we're in a season of breakdown? It seems violent. It feels offensive and negative. It appears abusive. It almost seems dishonorable because we've loved it for so long. But it's absolutely how many understand that President Trump has come into the season of breakdown, but he's come with big hammers and big bars? How many know God picked the right man for the job? Because guys who break down just have a natural instinct to be destructive. I used to throw Tonga toys off the top floor to see if I could break them. My dad still talks about that. He's born to be destructive. I should put that on the back of my car. You know what makes Trump's job so hard? It's the stupid homeowners. They're holding on to their old cabinets, clinging desperately to the old countertops while they're weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Why are you trying to change us so violently? Don't you care? Sadly, the church is no different. How many know what you cling to, what you hold on to? God doesn't. He doesn't even think the way you do. He's not even a Christian. <laughs> I love that part. Here's what you have to remember. God is holy. His way is to separate. And how many understand that God will have his way? Yes. 
I was just talking to my mom and dad about that before church. I said, I saw a breakdown of everything that Obama did during his administration to bring this nation to the lowest point that this nation has ever been since the beginning. This nation is on the verge of collapse, and we don't realize how close we came to it. And then they showed Hillary's agenda and everything she would do to put the final nails in the coffin. And how thankful we should be for the bullet we dodged. And I don't know how much longer we're going to dodge the bullet. I saw some things this week that made me so sick. See, when you think you know what evil looks like, there's always another level. There is so much. I, I don't understand how God withholds. I don't understand the patience of God. I would destroy the whole thing. I would say, hold on, kids. You're all going to die in this one. The world that we live in has become so rotten. I would never tell you the things. Because literally, when I was, some of the things I was reading, I was so broken and heavy for days because of some of the things that I saw. This nation and the world that we live in has become so vile, so filthy, so degraded. You can't even imagine. Even when I talk, I know you imagine things that it could be. You can't imagine what it could be. It's too terrible to even mention. We have been given an opportunity, and I believe it's because God wanted this season to be fulfilled. Look at 1 John chapter 1. This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. How many say amen? amen. God is light and in him is no darkness. No darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him but walk in darkness, we lie and we don't do the truth. You know what's bizarre about deception? Literally zero people believe that it affects them personally. We believe that there's a lot of other people that are deceived. But nobody believes that if you if I said to you, are you really deceived? And you'd say, oh, absolutely not. If anybody walks in light, it's me. <clears throat> right? Because that's human nature, isn't it? John wrote that God is light. What does he mean? God is wisdom. God is understanding. And in him is no darkness. The word means confusion, chaos, or disorder. In God, there's no confusion. I was reading an article about a guy this week, and he was saying about how Christianity literally is one of the most confused religions in the planet because Christians aren't like other religions. Other religions believe all the same thing. Christianity has no same belief. Very few. Isn't that true? God is light. God is understanding and wisdom and revelation. In God, in Him, there is literally zero confusion. So if the church is in confusion, where is God? There's no disorder in God. John writes that if we say we have fellowship with God, literally when he wrote fellowship, if we declare that we have fellowship with God, the word fellowship means direct communication, that we hear God, that we speak and we hear and we have direct communication. So, Christians say that. Christians say, I have direct communication with God. But if we walk in confusion and disorder, he said we lie. If the church says that they can hear the voice of God, yet they walk in all this confusion, he said, this is the words he gives, they lie. <clears throat> now, no Christian would ever admit that this was them. So in the heart of Christianity, we all have to say, well, we walk in light. We can't say we walk in darkness because then we're liars. <clears throat> he said we lie. The word literally is not like, you know, like FBI's doing. The word we lie, that word lie right there is a Greek word and it means we're deceived. <clears throat> if we say we have fellowship, direct communication with God, but we walk in confusion, then we're deceived. 
So if the church is literally by Jesus' own message, the light of the world, us, the church, the light of the world, we're the wisdom and the understanding of the world. And the world is filled with confusion and chaos. Who's deceived? We are. God is light. Light loves order. When God sent Jesus to the earth, it was to show the power of light over darkness, wisdom over chaos. Jesus is just amazing. You can't stop him. He's amazing. Wisdom. If you truly want to have fellowship with God, how many say yes? I want direct communication with God. Your desperate search must then be for light that is ever increasing. Look at John 8. Why don't you understand my speech? Even because you can't hear my word? You're of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. How many want to understand? You desperately desire to not be this person following this deception. You want understanding. Because Satan's the father of deception. How many agree with that? He is. I don't want to be influenced. How many know that filthy being? You know, I don't want any kind of his influence in my life. Regardless of what it takes, I don't want any of his influence in my life. Understanding is the new kitchen. In order to receive it, the old one must be violently removed. All those familiar cabinets and tops. All those memories. You think about it. You look at it. How bad do you want this new renovation? How bad do you want it? Are you willing to sacrifice for it? <coughs> do you desperately desire the will of God on earth as it is in heaven? If God is light then Satan represents darkness and blindness. If God is understanding, then Satan represents confusion. If God is order, then Satan represents chaos. Jesus said that Satan is the deceiver. He's the father of deception. He's the father of confusion. He's the father of deception. He's the father of disorder. He's the father of chaos. He's the father of foolishness. Proverbs 22, 15. Again. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction shall drive it far from it. Solomon says that the heart of a child is in agreement with foolishness. The word heart is the thought, the understanding, the mind, the awareness, the will, the self, the ego, all these things that you call you. And you can't argue foolishness out. You can't teach it out. You can't preach it out. The only way that he said it comes out, the rod. The rod drives it out. How many know that if there's a rod and driving involved, it's usually violent? The rod is the way of holiness. The rod separates. The rod of God circumcises foolishness from the heart. Yeah. Remember, circumcision of the heart, holiness, repentance, they're all synonymous. And only come through seasons of violent change. There are seasons of repentance. There are seasons when there's doors open for the change of thought. 
And if you don't act in that season, you'll miss the season. There's seasons of holiness. There's seasons of repentance. There's seasons in the spirit realm. True repentance is actually a violent change of thought. How many understand that division in our nation is growing? How many know that it can't end well? How many have ever thought that out? Just sat and thought and thought, this is just no way this can end well. Isn't that true? It just can't. All change All change comes through violent separation. You know what's amazing though? It's the way of God. How many desperately want to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, no matter what it costs? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What if it costs you your nation? What if it costs you the way you live? What if it costs you your comfort? What if you're separated from your loved ones? How many are willing to say, God, I don't care what it costs. To me personally, I don't care. I want your kingdom to come. Yes. Look at John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. How many are ready for a new birth? How many understand that there's not a birth without violence and pressure and struggle? Birth is actually a form of holiness. It's a separation. Isn't that true? Birth is a separating of two things. A mother and a child. It's a form of holiness. It's a violent separation of a mother and a child. How many understand that no one ever gives birth on the same day that they get pregnant? If you don't understand that, see me after. It's only after nine months of brutal change. Isn't there a brutal change? How many have ever seen a happy pregnant woman like in about the fourth or fifth month and she's just happy? And she's just glowing and happy. I have never seen a happy nine-month pregnant woman. I've seen a lot of pregnant women and I have yet to see one that is joyful in her night. She's waddling. Things are being displaced. There's a lot of discomfort and swelling in places that make it more uncomfortable. How many have ever heard a woman who was late in her pregnancy and she said, I am so ready for this baby to be born. <laughs> Why? Because she struggled and she struggled and now she's prepared. Mentally, the struggle, she says, I am ready for the violence of this birth. I am tired of struggling, and no matter what it costs me, I am ready for the violence of this birth. There's soon coming a new birth in the church. Yeah. Jesus told Nicodemus that the revelation of the kingdom of God on earth would come as a birth. Did you ever look at it like that? He said, unless the man is born again, the revelation of the kingdom of God to earth will come as violently as a birth. He didn't say it's all going to be smooth, easy sailing. Paul said in Romans 8 that all of creation is groaning and travailing in anticipation of of the delivery of the sons of God. Isn't that true? Yeah. How many have ever heard the word unbearable? <laughs> unbearable means not able to be endured or tolerated anymore. How many realize that the body can only endure the season of pregnancy for so long? 
and then the pressure becomes too great and the child has to come. The child literally becomes unbearable and the birthing season comes suddenly. The long wait is over. The process of violent separation begins. This is the time when men are glad they're men. <laughs> Matthew 24. Let me show you something. I'm almost done. This, moves, this whole thing moved me so much. God just showed me something. I'm really thankful. When he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And they said, tell us what shall these things be? What shall be the sign of the coming of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and he said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you do not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. It's just travail. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are just the beginning <coughs> of sorrows. The word sorrows is literally, this is the literal Greek translation of when Jesus said the word sorrows in the Greek, he didn't say the word sorrows. He said all these are the beginning of the travail of childbirth. How many understand no matter how desperately you want the baby, it will not come without the gripping, moan inducing pain doesn't matter how bad you are. There's no epidurals in the spirit realm. There are no C-sections. Nobody comes out of the skylight. <clears throat> Jesus says specifically in this. This is amazing because I never saw this. He says specifically that this is a season of labor, travail, and childbirth. In this scripture... Right here, Jesus uses the words labor, travail, and delivery, childbirth. This is John 3, 3, 4, 4, right here. Unless the man is born again, this is the birth. He told me that this week, I was amazed. This is John 3 being fulfilled. This is the church being born again. Look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 9. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended. And they'll betray one another. How many know we're in a time of many being offended? Snowflakes. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise and shall deceive many. I agree online all these men that are prophesying only good things. Jesus said there's during this season of tearing out, there's going to be a lot of false prophets will arise. And the people won't be ready. They'll be deceived and they won't be ready. They won't have been prepared. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be delivered. That's what that word means. Saved is the Hebrew word for delivery. Jesus is talking about the labor and the delivery of the sons of God that the earth is groaning for. It all ties together. This is the point in history. We're living in the beginning of the point in history where the man, unless the man is born again, we're living in the point in history where the man is about to become a new creature. Old things are going to pass away. All things are going to become new. This is when religion will be replaced with kingdom power. How many are ready for that? What's kingdom power for? Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to the nations. And then the end will come.
The new birth would bring forth a church filled with power and authority. What's it for? A witness to the nations. You know what's amazing about God? God doesn't destroy unless he warns. This is the great thing about God. God looks at the horrible evil and he still won't destroy unless he warns. God's going to bring a complete new birth to the church, the power and the authority of the kingdom is going to come to the church. What's it for? A witness to the nations. You know what the word nations is? The people that don't know God. The people that don't haven't been called or chosen. The gospel of Christianity has been mere words. The gospel of the kingdom will be the same gospel that Jesus came with. That's why he refers to, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom. He's not saying any gospel of the kingdom gets saved and go to heaven. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. There's nothing that you can do to hurry the new birth. But there's nothing that anyone can do to stop. Once the labor begins, there's nothing that will stop it. God's will will be done. Yes, yes. The outpouring of Joel 2 in Acts 2 is coming into sight. Look at Joel 2. It's my last scripture. Shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. You know what the, afterwards talking about? After the birth. He said, they'll be born and I'll pour my spirit on Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Upon my servant and my handmaid, in those days will I pour out my spirit. You know what the spirit is? Wisdom. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and the earth. Be like Moses is all in the earth again. Be like Jesus walking the earth again. His church. Wanders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He said, This is what's going to happen. He said, This is going to be the warning to the nations. The kingdom will be poured out. My children will walk in wisdom as a sign, as a witness. And then the terrible day of the Lord comes, the judgment. This is what the church will be. This is what the church is going to look like. The power of God on the church after the church is born again. Amen. Stand with me. Praise. This does. Father, we thank you for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's the power of God to bring deliverance. God, we believe you we believe we're coming into that time. And if I would ask for anything for the body of Christ, I would ask for courage. I would ask, Father, that we would keep our eyes fixed, regardless of what's going on around us. Yes. That we would walk seeking you, being able to ignore all that's happening in the world. Because we're in the world, but we're not of it. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood and a holy nation. You've chosen us, separated us from the world. Yes. Why? To bring the praise of God to multitudes. Father, we ask you that you would give us courage. That we would walk continually with our eyes fixed. Yes. That our hearts would be stayed. Father, that we would continually see at the next level, the next level of holiness in this season of repentance. Father, we're anxious for this remodel that you're about to do. We know there's a season of breaking down, but there's also a season where you build back up. Yes. And we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our nation. We trust you with the world. Thy will be done. 